So gene therapy is really changing the way we're practicing medicine. It's now possible just through one intervention to totally change the course of a patient's life, to transform their life. And it's truly an honor for us at Orchard Therapeutics to be part of that journey of bringing these transformative medicines to patients with rare diseases around the world. Now our mission, our vision if you like, right from the beginning has been to be a global, fully integrated biotech that transforms the lives of patients with rare diseases through innovative gene therapy. And the platform that we're working with is ex vivo gene therapy. And what you can see in this collage of patient pictures is some of the patients amongst the many that we've actually treated and whose lives have gone from very little hope to a transformed normal life. So it is a wonderful mission that we have. And as you're all aware, with the GSK deal last week that we announced last week, we've taken on board four new programs, ex vivo gene therapies from GSK, from all the wonderful groundbreaking work that GSK and its collaborators have done, you know, whether that's TGIT, San Raf Hospital San Raffaele, and their manufacturing partner, Molmed, where we've integrated them into our pipeline, and I believe, you know, created a world-leading pipeline of gene therapy medicines for rare diseases. And maybe to spend a couple of minutes on that. So basically, what you see here now in the aggregated pipeline at Orchard is one commercially approved therapy, Strimvelis, for ADA SCID, approved in Europe, and an additional six clinical stage programs in both you know, our immune deficiencies franchise, our inherited metabolic diseases franchise, and a potential emerging new franchise in hemoglobinopathies. To say a few words about those, so three of those clinical stage programs are in advanced registration trials. And so uh, this year, we're looking to file the ADA SCID program OTL 101 in the USA with the FDA. In 2019, we're looking to file the MLD program with the European Medicines Agency initially. And then in 2020, 2021, we're looking to file the Wiscott Aldridge syndrome program, all at the same time whilst progressing the clinical stage programs beyond that. So this is a really exciting time for gene therapy programs coming to the world. I'd like to now illustrate what I mean by the word transformation, because sometimes that can be a cheapened word. We use it quite a lot. But in my experience of 28 years in the industry, in the last 20 years of being in rare diseases, I haven't seen data like this before. So for an ADA patient, ADA skid patient, which has no immune deficiency, no immune system, untreated, they would normally have one or two years of life. They cannot fight infection. And as you can see in the core registration data set, for the filing as agreed with the FDA in 30 patients. These are the co-primary endpoints. Overall survival and event-free survival, going out for three years. And you can see 100% survival for th up to three years and 97% event-free survival, with only one patient needing rescue enzyme replacement therapy. So these are truly remarkable results, and it's an honor to be able to bring such medicines to the world. Now let's bring this to life. What does it mean for a patient? So this is a young girl called Nina. As a baby, at four weeks old, she had breathing problems, terrible diarrhea. She was hospitalized, fed through a nasogastric tube, needed oxygen IV antibiotics, and was tested and shown to have no lymphocytes. She was diagnosed with severe combined immunodeficiency. 
She was then transferred to Great Ormond Street Hospital, where she was diagnosed as having the ADA skid variety and immediately put on ADA enzyme to try and stabilize her condition. But her parents really wanted to find a more permanent solution. They considered bone marrow transplantation, but they were not willing to accept the risk of 30% mortality that was associated with that uh, option. And so they elected to put her into the gene therapy program back in May of 2013 with OTL 101. Now within three to six months, she started to reconstitute her own immune system, started to fight infection on her own, and was progressively taken off enzyme replacement therapy, prophylactic antibiotics, and also antibody infusions. Today, she's six years old. She goes to school with all her friends in normal conditions. She loves dancing, and she's just living a normal life. And so this is just one story of many of what gene therapy is able to do. And why I'm very optimistic about the future of gene therapy is if you just look at six of the programs out of that pipeline that I showed you earlier, and you look at the number of patients that have been treated so far in each of those programs, that adds up to about 130 patients. But also, not only have we seen transformative data in all these different indications, but when you look at the follow-up, since that gene therapy took place. You're seeing follow-up now ranging from two years in the case of X chronic granulomatous disease out to eight years for the Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome and metachromatic leukodystrophy uh, programs, but also if you even go out to ADA SCID and the Strimvelis program, it's nearly 18 years now. So we're seeing sustainability of effect here. And these are different diseases. And that's another, I think, encouraging factor when looking at the future of gene therapy with ex vivo gene therapy platforms. So I hope that we'll be bringing many more of these therapies to patients in the years to come. Thank you. Tess? Thank you, Mark. So I want to spend the uh, majority of the time we have left uh, on, on some of the new pipeline assets, obviously exciting partnership uh, that you recently announced with GSK. But maybe just first briefly, you could help us understand the strategy for the two ADA SCID uh, assets now. Mm -hmm. uh, Strimbellis, obviously approved in Europe, and, and OTL 101 uh, developed internally, uh, or the internal candidate pre predating the GSK partnership. So how should we think about the strategy for mm -hmm. those two assets now, US and globally? Yeah, I think, I think the first thing to say is, you know, thanks to that pioneering work that I referred to by GSK and its partners, TJET, San Raffaele, and Malmed, this has been the first option in the world brought to patients with ex vivo gene therapy for ADA SCID, and, and it's the only approved medicine in Europe. So our goal is to help as many patients who need that therapy to go on to Strimvelis in the coming months and years. Now, if you look outside of Europe, there is no ex vivo gene therapy treatment option for patients. And so our first priority will, bring, will be to bring OTL 101 to the US and to other markets around the world where there is no option today. That's great. So, so let's get into uh, uh, some of the other assets now. MLD, metachromatic leukodystrophy. Um, maybe just help set the stage. What is the typical clinical course uh, for a patient with that condition? And, and what data do you have in hand from OTL 200 um, that, that uh, gives you confidence as you move yeah. that forward? So I don't know how many of you know metachromatic leukodystrophy. It is a really truly devastating neurocognitive disorder, neurodegenerative disorder. Um, untreated, uh, if you look at the late infantile group, uh, by 75%, by five years old, 75% of these patients will have passed away. By 10 years old, 100%. And that's because there is a, a rapid decline in motor function, 
and there's also a progressive loss of cognitive function. Now, in a Lancet paper in 2016, in nine patients, the GSK and, and associate teams at TG at San Rafaele showed that um, if you treat these patients before irreversible damage has, been, has occurred, you actually can have these patients progress with normal motor function like a healthy individual. And not only that, you can show that cognitive function as measured using IQ is in the normal range. So I think this is an amazing breakthrough when you think of the challenge of treating CNS disorders. You know, this is, a, I think, a real breakthrough that brings promise to many CNS disorders in the future. In fact, the total data set for that program is now 30 patients. Um, and, you know, if you like, the matched controls for this uh, study, you know, rather sadly, is the siblings who were unable to take gene therapy because it was not yet available. And so there are something like 30 match controls, which shows the normal progress of this disease. And as I said, it's a, it's a very fast progressing devastating disorder. And as you think about registrational endpoints, w would that be uh, survival essentially, or, or would some of the cognitive and, and motor function uh, milestones and, 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 yeah. and ability um, be, need, be only what's necessary? So the, the, the primary endpoint really, you know, the most important one I think is the gross motor function measure. And as a secondary endpoint, we're also looking at cognitive function or IQ. And I think essentially we have a package here that we can bring to the FDA and the EMA, and we're looking forward to filing that next year and really trying to get this to patients as quickly as possible, as well as focusing on newborn screening as an area so that we can help identify patients as fast as possible. Okay, so let's talk about OTL 103, um, then uh, another uh, program that you have now. Wiscott Aldrich syndrome is the indication. Um, when will that program be ready uh, to file? Uh, and similarly, maybe just set the stage for that disease uh, um, and what you need to show uh, data-wise and, and in terms of endpoints. Yeah, this is another, this is an immune deficiency. It's again a very uh, devastating condition that affects you know, young kids and, and young adults. Uh, it's characterized by severe infections very low platelet counts, severe bleedings, regular hospitalization, and, of, and potentially lymphomas, with a median survival of 14 and a half years. And essentially what we've seen in uh, eight patients in a registration trial, we have seen, compared to baseline, a very significant reduction in severe bleeding, a significant reduction in infections, and also a significant reduction in hospitalizations. And so we think, again, gene therapy is showing that there's a real opportunity to help normalize a patient's life. Uh, we've supplemented that with some additional work in, uh, I think, another five patients. So we have currently 13 patients' data. And we're really engaging with the regulators to identify the sort of final elements that will allow us to bring this to, to market with a goal of 20, 2021 for filing. Great, and and as we've seen today, uh, and and just generally, um, recently, manufacturing um, is is a major theme uh, for gene therapy, and getting that right as early as possible. Uh, I don't know if you wanted to comment uh, just a little bit on your strategy in terms of manufacturing, and and um, what approach you take uh, at your company. Now, clearly, this is a key area, and as we look at a, a very significant platform, it's an area that you know we're putting a lot of focus behind because it requires a huge amount of capacity in the, in the years ahead. So we really have a three-pronged approach here. We're work, working extremely closely with partners like Oxford Biomedica, Lonza, PCT, now Hitachi, uh, on the ADA SCID program and, and other programs in our pipeline. Through the GSK uh, deal, we've also established now a, a great partnership with Molmed, which have a validated platform for both cell and vector manufacturing. But also, we're in, you know, enhancing our own in-house capabilities in California with analytics and process development, but also in time, you know, both cell and vector manufacturing as we have to 
right size, both with our partners and internally, to meet the challenges of this portfolio. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time, Mark.